network troubleshooting. So when we're dealing with network troubleshooting, we're trying to resolve network issues, and it's one of the main roles that we're going to have as a network administrator. We have different categories of network issues. The basic ones are our physical layer, which is our layer one, data link layer, which is our layer two, network layer, which is layer three, and wireless network issues, which can actually be a combination of any of those, because if it's an RS signal problem, it's going to be a physical layer. If it's an IP issue or a subnetting issue, it's going to be a network layer. And so we're going to talk through each of these, and we're going to talk about the CompTIA troubleshooting method, and then we'll go through a couple of example problems. So the basics of troubleshooting come down to a problem being reported, the problem is diagnosed, and the problem is resolved. Now this is an overly simplified troubleshooting method. I'm going to show you a more in-depth one that CompTIA uses in a second. But our troubleshooting basically comes in as a trouble ticket from a problem report. We then assign a technician who's going to try to fix it and solve that problem, and when they do, that's resolved. Um, again, this is a very simplified method. The majority of our troubleshooting efforts are spent diagnosing our problem, though. That's our second, second of that basic method there. And that's broken down into a couple of key steps. We're going to collect information from our customer, and we're going to find out what they think the problem is. Once we get all that information, we're going to start examining that information for clues. Based on that, we can start eliminating potential causes. We can then figure out or guess what we think the underlying cause is, and then we're going to verify if our guess is correct. And so when we get to the CompTIA troubleshooting methodology shown here on the left side, this is a structured approach that can save you time and is very repeatable. It prevents you from doing what's called hunting and pecking, where you basically just show up and start guessing and start going through commands and trying to see what works. Instead, we want to do a, a, myth, a standard methodology, and on this test, you have to use CompTIA's methodology. They will penalize you if you don't. So make sure you know this chart. Essentially, it starts out with defining the problem. Customer calls and says, I can't get on the internet. Right? That would be a problem definition. We're going to hypothesize or guess our probable cause. Why can't they get on the internet? Well, is it a layer one issue? Is the cable unplugged? Is it a layer two issue? Is the switch down? Uh, and it's not you know, switching traffic between them. Is it a layer three issue? They don't have a default gateway or they don't have DNS working. Is it a layer, you know, and you start going through these layers in your head and start thinking through the OSI model where these problems can be. And so now that I think I got a, a reason for the problem, I go, huh, maybe it's the cable that's unplugged. That's my guess. So then I'll go to number three. I'll test my hypothesis. I'll go over and check, is their network cable plugged in? And I see that it is, and there's blinking lights going on. Well, my guess was wrong. Back to number two, make another guess. Okay, maybe they don't have a default gateway. So I go and test my hypothesis by running an IP config command, and I see that they have a default gateway or they don't. If they don't, I go ahead and set it. I test to make sure it works, and I go on. So layer uh, step four, you create that action plan. I'm going to go and check this computer and make sure there's a gateway installed. Five, I implement it. I'm going to add that gateway for them. Six, I verify it solved the problem. Can they now get on the internet? If they can, great. I go to seven, creating that post-mortem report which is, now that the problem is done, what did I do to solve it? And I put that in the trouble ticket so that if somebody comes behind me the next day because the customer calls back with a problem, they know what I did. So if we start at the physical layer, we're going to start considering what things can go wrong from a network troubleshooting perspective. Physical layer is foundational to all the other layers. If layer one is broken, none of the other layers are going to work for you. Okay? So common issues, bad cables and connectors. Are the cables faulty or the connectors faulty? Did they use the wrong category of cable for the purpose? If you're using a CAT3 cable um, and everybody else is using CAT6 cables in the network, um, or you're running a CAT3 cable over a fluorescent light, it might cause EMI. And so if you're in a high EMI environment, you may want to use fiber cables instead. Things like that would be using the wrong cable. Cable placement. Um, if your cables are placed too close to high voltage cables, generators, motors, or radio transmitters, you can have EMI issues. So consider that, move those cables, or replace them with fiber cables that won't be effective. Distance limitations. Remember, the, the Ethernet distance limitations that we had. If you're using 10 base 2, 185 meters. 10 base 5, 500 meters. Anything that's a category 3, 5, 5E, 6, 6A or 7, 100 meters. Fiber, really, really far distances, as we talked about before. Um, don't split pairs in a cable. Some technicians are lazy. As we looked at our, our wiring diagrams for Ethernet, we saw that we only used four cables, one, two, three, and six. We did not use four, five, seven, and eight. Some lazy technicians 
will see that there's a jack on the wall and somebody says, hey, I need a second jack in that space. They will actually take that jack, break it apart, so they have two jacks being fed from one wire by using pins four, five, seven, and eight on a second jack and putting them on one, two, three, and six. That's called splitting pairs. If you do that, the problem is you now have all this ethernet traffic from two different computers going over one cable and they're wrapped around each other and they're gonna cause interference, okay? This can cause problems for you. It also leads to non-standard wiring of a jack, okay? So don't do splitting in pairs. You may find that in some networks, especially older networks where people have gone back over and over and over again to add more machines. EMI interference and crosstalk. Cable placement can cause this. Can cause this. If you put your cables over fluorescent lights, next to motors, next to high voltage cables, you're going to have EMI. You can also have crosstalk inside the wires that can cause EMI inside your cables. And again, if you use shielded cables, this will help minimize the EMI and proper cable placement will also do that. Lastly, you have your transpose, transmits, and receives. So media dependent interface crossover, MDIX. This allows a switch port to configure itself as crossover or normal based on the needs of the cable. Older switches don't support MDIX. And so on the exam, if they give you a switch and they don't mention the fact that it uses MDIX, assume it doesn't. And therefore, you're going to need a crossover cable. Remember, if we talked about switch to switch, you need a crossover cable. Router to router needs a crossover cable. Computer to computer needs a crossover cable. Two different types of devices, you use straight through. The same type of device, you're going to need a crossover cable. And you'll see that become a problem. The data link layer, layer two. So when you understand layer two switch operations, you have to understand this because it's critical to a lot of our LAN issues. So you can have a bad module. On most professional switches, you can swap out the interface. So if you see here, I, I have a Cisco switch, and you see how it's pulled that module out. I can take that module out and replace it. I also can take that module out and switch it out from a Cat5 to a Cat5e, or take it from a Cat5e to a fiber connector if needed. Layer 2 loops. If your spanning tree protocol is failing, you're going to get a loop, a spanning tree loop, and this can cause a broadcast storm. We talked about this in the STP module. This is, if you have a misconfigured STP, your traffic will start taking suboptimal paths, and this can result in network degradation as well. So you either get loops or you get suboptimal paths that will slow down your network. Port misconfiguration. Your ports have to be configured properly. If you don't have them set properly for that MDIX like we talked about and have the wrong cable, that's going to cause a problem. It can cause no communication for you. If you have the wrong speed or duplex set, you can get slow communication. So for instance, if my PC is set to do 10 megabits per second half duplex and my switch is set to full 100 they're not talking the same language and we're gonna have a lot of slow or no communication so make sure your your speeds and duplexes match VLAN configurations your traffic has to be routed between VLANs keep that in mind VLANs are their own broadcast domains so therefore you have to route them if you, all your devices on the same VLAN they are all should be on the same subnet If you put them on se separate subnets they're not going to talk to each other so you might have issues where your computer is not on the same subnet as its gateway. That's going to cause problems and the computer's not going to be able to get off the network. Because again, traffic needs to be routed from a VLAN. Layer 3, our network layer, is crucial to troubleshooting many of our LAN and WAN issues because at this point we're dealing with IP addressing. We can have problems with our routing protocols, our subnetting, and services like DNS. If you have a duplicate IP address, that's two hosts that have the same IP address, one of them can get kicked off the network or both can get kicked off the network and that can cause conflicts where one keeps coming up and dropping off and the other one comes up and drops off at different times so you want to check that again using DHCP will help prevent this incorrect default gateway if your host is, has the incorrect de default gateway set up it's not going to be able to leave the local subnet so verify your default gateway is correct and make sure they're both in the same subnet incorrect DNS configuration if you have an in, uh, incorrect DNS server set up, that workstation is not going to be able to go to the internet via domain names. So if you try to go to google.com, it's not going to work if DNS isn't set up. It's only going to be able to do it based on IP addresses. And a quick way to check this is if you go into your command prompt and you use ping, and you ping google.com and it comes back failed, and then you try ping 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 and it succeeds, that means your WAN link is up, but your DNS is broken because you can talk to IPs but you can't talk to names. Mismatch MTUs, the maximum transmission unit size, is defined as the largest packet size the router will forward. If your MTU is too small, your packets will be dropped. 
And so usually MTUs are set by default at 1500. This can become a problem when you start using um, IPsec if you start putting encryption uh, over it and it starts padding those packets. It can actually increase the size bigger than the router can accept and start dropping packets on you. So you might want to check your MTU size. Wireless troubleshooting. So when we troubleshoot wireless networks, we actually have to look at layer one, two, and three issues. Because layer one is actually the radio frequency itself. That's our medium. We can have issues with the placement of our access points. We can have frequency issues. So we have to deconflict the frequencies. And we could have single strength issues. So if we have radio frequency interference, this can happen from baby monitors, cordless phones, uh, microwave ovens, all those things we talked about back in wireless networks. Remember, if you're using 2.4 gigahertz, there is a lot of stuff in that spectrum. One of the ways to overcome that is switch over to a 5 gigahertz signal by upgrading to an N or an AC network. Another way to overcome it is figure out what things are being used in that frequency band and pick a different channel. Misconfiguration of wireless parameters. There's lots of different settings you have to set up for your wireless to work. You have to make sure the channel is right, the SSID broadcast ID is right, you need to make sure the encryption is right, and if your access point and your client don't have the same on all of those, you're not going to be able to connect. Third thing, incorrect access point placement. We talked many times before in wireless that we needed to have channels 1, 6, and 11 for 2.4 gigahertz networks, and they need to be in a honeycomb pattern. Therefore, there should be overlap, but not of the same channel numbers. We want that 10 to 15% overlap, but we want channel 11 and channel 1 to be next to each other, not channel 1 and channel 1. And signal strength. Our received signal strength indicator might be too low due to physical objects interfering with the wireless signal or the antenna being too far from the access point. If this happens, you either need to boost the signal on the router if it supports it, and if not, you need to get closer to it. So sometimes it's just an easy solution of saying, your desk can't be on that side of the room, it's got to be on the left side of the room. And we just move the person. So I'm going to give you guys a quick troubleshooting problem. We're going to work through this one together. So troubleshooting problem number one, client A at the top can't talk to server one at the bottom. The switches used are older and they don't support MDIX. Why do you think that the client can't reach the server? What do you guys think? So in layer one, we're going to start with layer one here. We have all straight through cables being shown between client A and the server. They're all straight through. And in the question it says, these are older switches and don't support MDIX. If you're going from a switch to a switch, you have to have a crossover cable. So if we replace this cable here, the crossover cable, it will fix the problem. Okay? So this is a layer one, layer two problem. It's the wrong cable. So in this case, we want a crossover cable there. All right? Problem number two. Client A cannot communicate with server number one. What do you think the issue is? Well, we have VLAN 1 up here at the top. We have VLAN 2 here in the middle and VLAN 3 here in the bottom. So what do you guys think the problem might be? They're not going through the router. Exactly. So going from client A to server 1, we need a router in between switch 1 and 2 because these different VLANs, 1, 2, and 3, uh, 100, 200, and 300 are all different, and therefore you need to have routers there to route the traffic. Remember, on the Network Plus exam, unless they say a switch is a multi-layer switch, it is by default a layer 2 switch. And so if you have VLANs, you better see a router right here to connect this VLAN, this VLAN, and this VLAN to route that traffic between them. Problem number three. Client A again, cannot communicate with server number one. What do you guys think the problem is this time? Now we've got some IP addresses here, right? So we're dealing with a slash 27, which would be 32 IPs per subnet. So the first one's going to be 0 to 31. Next one's going to be 32 to 63. The third one is going to be 64 to 91. Sorry, 30, yeah. 62 to 95 and the third one and the fourth one will be 96 and above. So what that tells us is that these two guys are in one subnet, this guy is in another. And again, there's no router here. So either we need to change the server IP to make him in the same subnet as these two by dropping his IP down to something like 94 or 90 sorry 93 um, or we need to add a router where this fiber connection is. So are they all in the same subnet? No, they're not. 
this guy's on the same subnet as this guy, but that guy is not. And again, we do that based on looking at our subnets, and there's 32 IPs for, per subnet for a slash 27. These are the kind of problems you're going to see on the Network Plus exam. So we have two different subnets being utilized. So we change him to an IP inside that scope, and we will be good. Problem number four, what is the design in this network topology? So here we have two access points connected to a switch, then connected to a router and out to the ISP. We have our 10 to 15% coverage area, which is good. We like our 10 to 15% coverage area. We're dealing with 2.4 gigahertz band. So when we deal with 2.4 gigahertz, what channels do we want? One, six, and 11. And what do we have here? One and five. That's going to cause us a problem because the 5 is going to cause interference with the 1 inside this overlap area. And so therefore we need to change those to 1, 6, and 11. So change the bottom one, uh, access point 2 there, into a 6 or an 11 and that will solve your problem. And that's some good examples of some types of troubleshooting problems you might have on the exam, whether they're graphical like that or they describe them in words. Uh, other problems you might see on the exam for that will be things in command prompts. So they're going to give you like a route table and you'll have to look at that and figure out why things aren't making it to the internet. Or they'll give you an IP configuration and you'll have to figure out why you're not connected. Uh, and those are things that we'll work through in class as well.